Peter Valentino. Just there. A big applause for Peter Valentino. So tonight we will have performers from different states of the United States, from New Jersey, from uh, California, here of course, from New York, and as well from other countries like Argentina and Spain. So, I will introduce you the first scene, uh, Michael and, let me see if I have the correct name, just one moment, and Stephanie, an applause. kids are where they are. They know you want their ass to be invisible. You're a tall, damn crybaby, Charles. I don't know why you're gonna kill me when I was born. Are you really my child? Go sit your stupid ass down. You get crazier every day. If you love me, mommy, you would have killed me like those women did back on the plantations. They killed them kids that don't have to be slaves. I don't know why you didn't kill me so I to live for your shit. I guess I didn't love my children because I wanted them to live. So the best you can do is to teach us how to be afraid. How to be scared. You better be afraid, Charles. You better be scared. These police, this world out here, they'll kill you, Charles. You and your revolution. Do you hear me, son? I can find people change anything, Mom. There are no other kind of people, son. I'm scared every day, but I do my job. If you ain't scared, you ain't got no need for guts. The group ain't coming back. What you gonna do now? I'm going to go in my room, get some sleep, and take my scared ass to work tomorrow. So before you call it a day, take a look at Charlene's tits. Look at that grandma. She's 
<laughs> don't you dare walk away from me. And don't tell me you're sorry. Don't tell me to forget it. And don't you dare tell me to let go. Lord knows. I wish I could. But I can't. I can't forget that we had something and you're running away. You're running away. Don't you see, Mark? You're running away from what I searched for all my life. Why? Because you're scared? Well, I'm scared too. But you and I, we have something we're fighting for. We could make it work. Look, I'm not saying it would be easy, but I care about you. And deep down, under this bravado, I know that you care about me. And that's what it's all about, Mark. Don't you get it? It's the human experience. You can pretend all you want, but you're only lying to yourself. You're denying the simple and wonderful fact that you're emotional, vulnerable, and alive. Can you honestly stand there and tell me that I mean nothing to you? That everything that happened that night was a lie? That you felt nothing? You have friends, yeah? Well, I have some too. Yes, I do. One of them was named Brady. Brady was my friend. He was from Mobile, Alabama. We were a lot alike, Brady and me. He was, uh, he was drafted, like I was. Came from the same kind of family. You know, nice people. But we were both supposed to come home around the same time, and uh, it was about a month before we were supposed to leave. But Brady got wounded. And when he left the hospital, this was in uh, this was in California. <clears throat> when he got out of the hospital, he called his parents, you know, to let them know that he was okay and to ask if it would be all right if he brought a friend with him. So his mother says, "Fine, no problem." So Brady says, "Well, you know, this guy doesn't move around very well yet," and his mother says, "All right, well, what's wrong with him?" Brady says, he's lost an arm and a leg. He's probably going to need a little help. Well, the mother just lost it. I mean, she couldn't handle that at all. So she goes. 
she puts his father on the throne. And his father really is a tomb. Why are you doing this to us? This is what he says, his father. Don't you know how much we've been looking forward to this? Why are you trying to ruin everything for us? So, Brady apologizes. And when he gets off the phone, he goes and checks himself into a Holiday Inn and he hangs himself in the bathroom. They shipped his body to Mobile, and I have tried to picture the expression on his parents' faces when they went to the airport to pick up Brady's body. The expression on his parents' faces when they saw that their little soldier boy was missing an arm and a leg. That's right. I ate the divorce papers. And I ate them with ketchup. <laughs> and they were good. But good. You probably want me to get serious about our divorce, but the thing is, you always call our marriage a joke. So, let's use logic here. If A, we never had a serious marriage, then B, we can't have a serious divorce. No, we can't. The whole thing is a farce, Michael. A farce that tastes good with ketchup. <laughs> I mean, wasn't it last week when your dad asked you the reason you walk down that aisle with me, and you talk him for the exercise? <laughs> That's funny. You know, I'm laughing. Ha ha, I'm not crying. Because you're about to give up on a woman who's infinitely lovable. <laughs> for instance, Paul, he loved me since eighth grade. Yeah, he is a little creepy, but he really <laughs> loves me. <laughs> He's made more than 127 passes at me, proposed 40 times, and he sent me over 200 original love songs. He sees something in me, Michael, and he writes it down in middle verse. <laughs> and that's not something you find every day. Someone who really loves everything you are as a person. Paul may be insane, but I value his feelings for him. <laughs> I will never ask him to sign up his name on a piece of paper promising to turn off his feelings for me forever. But that's what you are asking me to do. For you. I've written you a sonnet. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds to shake. The darling buds of May and... I'm not crying. <laughs> I'm laughing. It's, it's sort of a big joke. I keep waiting for you to say, April Fools. And then I rush into your arms and turn my home to are you No. Of course not. It's not it. All right, see, that's what I'm talking about. That's the perfect form that I'm talking about. Yes, a winner form. See, I'm gonna stop you right now, baby. I'm gonna stop you right now. I'm going to New York with you. Oh, 
Bucky Harris, the Yankees manager, gave me the job as coach as long as you're on my team. Man. Oh, well, if you're the coach, you must know the guys on the team. You know all my players' names, man. You're a crazy bunch. All right, well, you know, I never met the guys. Mm -hmm. So if you tell me the names, then I'll know who's playing on the team. Ooh, I'm going to warn you. Uh -huh. I know they give these ball players very peculiar names now. Oh, you mean funny names? I'm talking about pet names. Weird, weird names, bro. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm no stranger to that, so I'll go ahead and tell me the names. You insist on this, huh? Well, yeah, why not? All right. We have who on first, what's on second, <laughs> I don't know on third. Well, that's what I'm trying to find out. I said who on first, what's on second, I don't know on third. Uh, look, man, you're going to be the coach, right? Yes. And you're the manager, too? Yes. And you don't know the fellas' names? Well, I should know all of their names. Well, who's on first? Yes. No, I mean the first base. Who? First base. Who? The guy on first base. Who? The first base. Who's on first? I'm not asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Then go ahead and tell him. That's it. That's who? Yes. <laughs> all right, let's, let's, let's try this again. You got a first base? Yes. Who's on first? That's it. <laughs> All right. When you pay the first baseman every month, mm -hmm. who gets the money? Every dollar. Look, I'm just trying to find out who gets the money. Every dollar of it. And sometimes his wife even come and collect the money. Whose wife? Yes. <laughs> well, what's wrong with whose wife? All right, look. You get a receipt from the guy, right? Yes. Okay. When you get the receipt, how does he sign his name? Who? The, the, the guy. Who? How does he sign? That's how he signs it. That's how he signs it. Yes. Look, I'm, I'm just, it's a simple question. What's the name, what's the name of the guy on first base? What's on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. But he's on third and we're not even talking about Whoa, him. whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. How'd I get on third base? Why did you mention his name? Well, if I mentioned the third baseman's name, who would I say was playing third no, base? who's playing first? What's on first? What's on second? I don't know. He's on third. There I go. Back on third base again. Look. Back on third base again. All right, look, look. Did you say? All right, look. What do you want to know, Costello? All right. Who's on third base? Why do you insist on putting who on third base? What am I putting on third base? No, what is on second base? What's on first? He's on third base. I don't know. He's on third. Back on third again. You got an outfield? Yes. Okay, left field's name. Why? <laughs> well, I just thought I'd ask it. And I thought I'd just tell you, Costello. Then go ahead. Who's playing left field? No, who's playing first? <laughs> <laughs> All right. You got a pitcher on this team. Duh. Okay, the pitcher's name. Tomorrow. You don't want to tell me today? I'm telling you now. Well, go ahead. Tomorrow. What time? What time what? What time tomorrow are you going to tell me who's pitching? Now listen, who is never Look, pitching? I'm going to break your arm and say who's on first one more time. Now I want to know what the pitcher's name is. What's on second base? What's on first? Who's, he's on third base. Well, I don't know. Third base. Third base. Third base. Third base. <laughs> you got a catcher on this team? Yes. Okay, the catcher's name. Today. Okay, so we got today catcher and tomorrow pitcher. Now you got. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, all we got is a couple of days on the team. You know, I'm a pretty good catcher myself. Yes, I know this, man. Yeah, yeah so I get behind the plate to do some fancy catching. Okay. And the heavy hitter gets up. Okay. And he bunts the ball. Yes. Now, when he bunts the ball, mm -hmm. I'm going to throw the guy out of first base. Yes. Now, when I throw the ball, mm -hmm. I'm going to throw it to who? Yes. That's the first thing you can set right all night. I don't even know what I'm talking about. That's all you have to do is throw the ball to first base. Yes. All right. And he has it naturally. And he has Okay. Who's got it? Naturally. Okay. All right, so I'm going to throw the ball to who? Yes. Whoever it is drops the ball and the guy runs the second yes. base. Who picks up the ball and throws it to what? Yes. What throws it to? I don't know. Yes. I don't know. Throws it back to tomorrow. Yes. Triple play. Yes. Another guy gets up and it's a long fly ball to be caught. Yes. What? Yes. I don't know. He's on third and I don't care. What? I said I don't care. No. That's our short stop. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you lie to me? You lied to me about dating my ex. I can never trust you again. What kind of friend are you? We've been friends for 10 years. Sarah saw 
you both dancing and kissing at the party. I can't believe you would do this. Were you just waiting? Were you just waiting for us to break up? Were you seeing each other behind my back? I feel so betrayed and hurt by you. I trusted you. Were you trying to get me back for something? You were supposed to be my friend. I want you out of my house. I want you out of my life forever. Get out! to hear is a fairy tale. Not an ordinary fairy tale that Disney would write, but a modern day fairy tale. Names have been changed to protect both the innocent and the guilty. This is titled, The Princess and the Penis. <laughs> Once upon a time in a faraway land called Woodland Hills, <laughs> there lived a happy nuclear family with a princess, a penis, their three offspring, Diana, David, and Denise, and a perky Pomeranian called Valentino. <laughs> Life was good. Actually, it was amazing. The princess and the penis had it all. The house, the kids, the family, the friends, the business, and a pretty darn good sex life. The princess was not your ordinary royalty, though, because she worked like a dog, both inside and outside the home. She always wanted to make her penis happy. She would work all day long and then would come home and make him a gourmet meal every fucking night. <laughs> she also exercised regularly because she wanted to stay attracted to the penis. She believed that if you did all the right things, that you would live happily ever after. Is anyone starting to sense a shift in this story? <laughs> so, when... The penis turned 50. The princess threw him a beautiful, beautiful birthday party. She invited all of her closest friends and even wrote him a magnificent love letter in Spanish. Sadly, half the people there didn't understand a word she was saying. And uh, unfortunately, this was the beginning of the end. Something happened after this momentous occasion. The penis felt like life was missing something important, profound. So he decided to make up for lost time and slept with every horse skin and pretty much anything with a vagina attached to it. <laughs> he put on his winning smile and his flamboyant clothing and made sure to wear clean underwear every single day because you never know who you might meet. <laughs> so, the princess would constantly forgive him for his indiscretions because she believed in their not so perfect union. And she continued to make his dinner every fucking night. <laughs> she thought, well, you know what? I can make this work. Sadly, that was not the case. So after 24 years, of marriage, multiple years of deep denial, and penis therapy that proved absolutely useless, <laughs> she came home one day and discovered a secret email filled with racy photos and descriptive sex acts that would make Jerry Springer lose his shit and say, Oi, me! <laughs> she thought, well, you know what? This really isn't working. But she was quite impressed with his 
tender heart because he makes sure to wish these assorted whores a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and a Happy Valentine's Day, even going so far as to write a holistic wellness protocol filled with herbs and vitamins from one of the multiple choice vaginas when she couldn't meet him one night to suck his dick. She decided enough is enough. And she threw the penis and his flashy sports car out of the house. After, of course, she screamed, cried, threw things all over, and slapped his face so many times that she hurt her wrist. She said, go, vaya con Dios. So anyway, after that, she wiped her tears, put on her lipstick, poured herself a big glass of Pinot Grigio with a CBD, uh, you know, chaser, <laughs> and basically got her shit together. I am happy to report that she is no longer a princess, but has been elevated to queen of her castle. She lives happily ever after with her three offspring and her very spoiled Pomeranian. What is the moral of this story? <laughs> Life will throw you curveballs, and sometimes the thing that you think is the worst possible event to ever happen to you could turn out to be the greatest blessing. You put on your crown and you strut your stuff like a fierce queen you are. You live a joyous life and you write your own damn fairy tale ending. And also, what a take out once in a while because cooking dinner every fucking night is for schmucks! <laughs> Thank you for listening. See So, boys, you know what to do with your <laughs> So, the next one is uh, Tania Morales. I was in love. He died. I found out he left me a message that he loved me. I didn't get it. Now, I'm sick to death of everything. This apartment, this laundry, the fact that things get dirty, the law, just being here. Sometimes I swear I want to pull the covers over my head and never do anything ever again. I'm drinking like I never have before. And all I want to do is have another. Everything just gets swallowed up by Ornus Scott. I'm not built to be an unhappy person. I like to laugh. I laugh like a banshee at videos on YouTube all day and then I just sit here alone. In this stupid little apartment wondering what the hell happened to my life. I just, I, I, I hurt, and I, I just want it to be over, I just want it to end. Yeah. 
I just, I want love. And it's over. It's over. What am I still doing here? How do you do, uh, Natalie? Nice to um, disturb you. Uh, wait, wait, no, I, I just wanted to, 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 to talk with you about your feelings. Uh, Natalie, look, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about last night, and, and you hadn't been responding to any of my texts. So I, I, I just want to say, basically, I, I, I know we didn't discuss consent when we had sex last night. I, then get a verbal yes. <laughs> You've been sitting in an emergency exit seat. I would have been a horrible flight attendant. <laughs> Look, I, I, I just wanted to ask her, are we cool? <laughs> did, did, did I do anything that wasn't okay with you? If I did, I'm, I'm really, really sorry. Oh. So you're, you're saying you want there to be a next time. <laughs> Oh, with, with, with other people. <laughs> it, it was just that the sex was bad? <laughs> so, 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 to, so to confirm, I, I, I didn't assault you, it was just bad sex? <laughs> time than you have with me. Oh, fuck. See? <laughs> May everything come true. May they believe. And may they laugh at their passions. For what they call passion is not really the energy of the soul, but merely the friction of the soul between the outside world. But above all, may they become as helpless as children, for softness is great and strength is worthless. When a man is born, he's soft and pliable, but when he dies, he's strong and hard. When a tree grows, it is soft and pliable, but when it dies, it is strong and hard. Hardness and strength are the companions of death. Flexibility and softness are the embodiment of life. That which is hard shall not triumph. Hey, hey. I really needed to talk to you. I wanted to talk to you too. Yeah, I just feel like lately we haven't been communicating. I know, it's like we barely even talk. And last weekend, I mean, you just left me and... and even when we're together, I feel like I'm alone. So, I feel it's best that we... And because of that, I think that... Wait a second. Hang on. Are you, you breaking, breaking up, up with me? me? You can't break up with me, I'm breaking up with you. Oh, you can't break up with me because I'm breaking up with you. I called you, clearly this is my break. Oh, no, no, no. You called me back, it's different. How is it different? Because I called to break up with you. Whatever. You know what? You can't break up with me because I'm the most amazing girlfriend you've ever had. <laughs> I'm the most amazing boyfriend you've ever had. You're amazing? A guy whose underwear looks like a scoop of Rocky Road? It goes with striped pants! <laughs> How many times do I have to tell you? Whatever. I already decided I was breaking up with you. That's why I wasn't taking any of your calls. 
You weren't taking my calls? Well, I wasn't taking your calls because I decided that I was going to break up with you. Whatever. You said I was the most amazing girlfriend you've ever had. Well, I say a lot of things to try to get laid. Uh -huh. Uh oh. So it's like that. <laughs> yeah. It's like that. And by the way, I hate your parents, your friends and ass, and your cat stinks. Don't you talk about Mr. Whiskers. <laughs> I'm the most amazing boyfriend you've ever had. My worst boyfriend. <laughs> you've never even had an orgasm until you met me. You still have it. Oh. <laughs> you think you're what? the only one who can make things up? Oh. Ah. Ooh. Ah! It's so big! It's not! It's fine. That's totally fine. It's even finer. I think it's even finer. It's finest. See? Oh. This is why we can never work. You can never just let me win. You can never just let me be a man. I let you be a man if you act like one. No, I mean, I have a problem with giving up control, and I need to work on that. You really do. I know. When I was 19, I was going to meet this guy, Max. Cute guy, very sincere. He had dark hair that kept falling into his eyes. He made me laugh just to look at him. His smile would light up at him. We were staying at his parents' place on Cape Cod, a place I loved so much. I thought one day I'd tell him to him. One day he told me about this dream he had. In the dream, we were swimming in the ocean. We were happy, playing around. He remembered me throwing my arm around his neck, giving him a big kiss. Mm. It wasn't much of stretch since we had maybe had some intense makeup sessions. Suddenly in the dream, we got cut up by a strong current and carried far out to sea. And no amount of struggling made any difference. We just kept drifting up farther and farther and farther. It didn't take Sigmund Freud to figure out what this meant. You are afraid of losing control, I told Max. You are afraid of getting in over your head, of being carried away by your feelings. No, I'm not, Max said. But it was no use. He was right there in his dream. So how could you deny it? Go ahead, he said, which was a big deal, since we told each other how much we hated swear words. In fact, the whole thing was a big deal, since this was our first argument and everything was so perfect up to this point. Anyway, I kept saying, you're afraid of being in love with me. 
and he kept denying me. You stopped talking to him. What else was there to say? I think I cried. Alina, maybe not. <laughs> and then Max turned around, he took his clothes off, and changed it to his games. And I told him, I'm going in naked. He stood up in silence. And then he looked at me, took off his clothes, he smiled, held my hand, and bring around into the sunlight and jumped into the water. Mm. But soon, we got cut out by a strong current and dragged out to sleep. <laughs> and the farther we fought against it, the farther we were dragged out <laughs> until the shore disappeared. We were helpless. There was nothing left except us and the endless blue water. Waves were rolling past one after another. Not even clutching with each other. Not even between 50 feet. Except this family of Cape Cod standing on the bridge, overlooking the ocean, admiring the day, or whatever Cape Cod is doing. <laughs> they saw us and ran down to dock, the entire motor, and they clutched us from the jaws of the ocean as it was about to swallow us up. And we were hugging each other so tight. It felt, it felt like we would never let go. <coughs> and we were crying and hugging and murmuring over and over and over. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Are you all right? And this gave way to me. I love you. I love you so much. I almost lost you. This was the first time a boy said those words to me. And then a voice inside my head said, that's it. You have found each other. You will never be lonely again. And I held them Max so tight, knowing that we would always be together, no matter what. We will never lose each other again. Except we did. This closeness between us went off like a drug, like some kind of emotional demerol. We both tried to ignore it at first, to make believe that nothing was changing, that nothing had changed. <coughs> but it was no use. I just could feel relaxed, drifting away from me. And the harder, the more I struggled, the more I tried to get a hold on him, the more distant he got. One day I just couldn't take it anymore. I just couldn't stand looking at him. I made up an excuse about having to get back to my parents. He pretended to be disappointed. He went through the motions, trying to pursue me to stay. Oh, I'll come and see you next week at your parents, he said as I was leaving. But he never did. In fact, I never saw him. So what was the meaning of Max being? <coughs> that we were going to drift apart and lose touch with each other? As my second marriage falls apart, and I feel I'm losing, I feel I'm like losing hope on everything and everyone I once loved, on everything that once seemed so stable. 
I keep returning to that dream. And I wonder, was it really that simple? Is it all really that simple? And why I didn't see that before? All these years later, and after losing so much, I refuse to accept that. Yes, that's what happened to me and Max. And yes, we're all born alone and die alone. All of them. But I have two daughters right now. Lola and Rasha. And I will never let that happen to them. I will fight the ocean with everything I have in my heart if I ever see them drifting into that Jamaica. You have my word, Lola and Rasha. I will not let that happen. So how do you feel? Everybody right? Yeah. yeah. So now we finish and we just Big, big applause for the, all the performers. Performance, please.